Welcome to the dark stream, Vox Day, voxday.blogspot.com, and Infogalactic News. So I was thinking about the way in which uh, the alt-right is being continuously um, attacked, falsely defined, incorrectly described, and uh, you generally mischaracterized. Um, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's you know the Democratic president for candidate. It doesn't matter whether it's the Southern Baptist Convention. It doesn't matter whether it's Christian conservatives or secular atheists. They all do the same thing. Why? Because we violate their narratives. You know, some of these others are not, you know, the, the, the cuck servitors are not SJWs. It's important to understand that just because they might behave in, in the same way in a particular circumstance doesn't mean, doesn't make them the same. But we're seeing this sort of behavior again and again and again. So it got me thinking, you know, about what, what can I do? I mean, you know, we've already got the 16 points out there. Um, they, you know, they've been translated into, into tons of languages. Um, I think uh, somebody just emailed me from the Czech Republic. Uh, they're going to be sending me a Czech translation soon. Um, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's out there, and yet people can simply just ignore it. You know, why? You know, why? Um, I mean, you know, I believe that the reason that they're constantly looking uh, to Richard Spencer is because he's useful to their narrative. But, and, and, and that's true, that's true. But there's a little bit more to it because, um, you know, I have struggled for years with this whole video medium. You know, I had the opportunity to pursue television as early as 1993, I think. Um, it was either 1992 or 1993. Uh, the local NBC affiliate had me in, and they were, you know, maybe wanted to do a regular section on games. Um, and I just, it wasn't for me. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't good at it. Um, later, when my first, um, when my first uh, column was nationally syndicated, I realized that, um, you know, I wasn't going to be on Fox anytime soon. You know, uh, I looked a little too radical at the time. Uh, I didn't have the the right male voice, um, you know, I didn't have the executive hair, uh, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I, I figured out early on that I was not going to do that. Later, when YouTube came around, I did look into, I did look into doing something on it, um, but I shied away from it because, frankly, it, it's just not something, it, it, it involves a lot more work than, than I'm inclined to do. I like writing. I like to write. I can just throw it up there. Um, something like this, you know, Periscope, I, I'm, I'm beginning to get comfortable with it. You know, it, it doesn't bother me. Um, you know, I've also been doing uh, Stefan Molyneux shows with a fair degree of regularity and, um, and I'm, I'm getting, you know, more and more comfortable talking into a camera. Uh, it's a lot easier when I'm talking to Stefan, you know, when, when I'm looking at a picture of Stefan. Um, but the point is, is that I've realized that I can do it. Um, so what I'm considering doing, and, I'm, and this is kind of what I'm, I'm, you know, since you guys are the, the people who watch me in this medium more than anyone, I already have a mic. The mics don't work, so relax. Um, and no, we're not talking about Periscope. Um, so what I'm thinking is, uh, 
I'm thinking of uh, amping up my YouTube channel and essentially um, following the lead of Stefan Molyneux. Now, I would probably do things rather differently than Stefan. Um, you know, I would probably do shows that focus more on, on books, either books that I like, talking with authors that interest me. Um, you know, we were looking at doing a, a, a book club with someone else, um, <laughs> but uh, he ended up uh, being a little bit too busy. So um, I think it's just Vox Day. We should probably, so the, but the question is, um, you know, do we, so maybe I need to create a new, um, maybe I need to create a new um, setup just for that. Um, maybe it needs to be combined with Periscope and Gab TV. I don't know. But what I'm interested in, in knowing is, is this the kind of thing that you guys would be interested in tuning in for? And we'd probably do it on the, we'd probably do it on the Stefan model. You know, just accept, uh, accept contributions, maybe have, I don't know, maybe have some sort of paid subscription thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, right now I'm just toying with the idea because I realize that, you know, I'm putting in, I'm putting in half an hour, um, you know, every day on this sort of thing. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, right now there's a very small channel that takes these periscopes, uh, Judeo Christ does it. And so, um, you know, or maybe, or maybe we, maybe we fund it with a blockchain thing or something. Um, I can talk to Brendan about how he did that with, um, how he did that with, um, uh, Brave. And so, um, no, we can't, the thing is we can't use Patreon and we can't use, and we can use YouTube, but we can't, we're not going to base it on uh, YouTube advertising. In fact, I don't even know if we'll bother. I don't know if it's possible to set it up without even using YouTube advertising. I'm, I'm, I don't work with YouTube. Um, but I'm not going to do that because whatever we do is going to be set up in a um, set up in a way that minimizes the ability of SJWs to interfere with it and shut it down. Um, and so, you know, it'll be interesting to see, um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how we do it. Counterfund doesn't, wouldn't matter for this. Um, I mean, I'm not, we're not looking to uh, get people to fund it. You know, this is something, if I decide to do this, we're going to do it without asking anyone to uh, support anything. No, it might have to be on, it might be on YouTube, but it's not going to be dependent on YouTube. We're not going to do paywalls. If I do a, if we do a pro subscription thing, we'll come up with most of the content is going to be free, open, and accessible. Brainstorm is, is similar. We do that with Brainstorm. Um, we do closed and we do open. So, um, you know, so I'm probably going to talk to, I'll probably talk to uh, Scooter. Um, you know, he's he's the video guy that I would probably plan to work with. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I don't know exactly what we're going to do. I just wanted to see if there was um, interest in this from uh, the people who are watching my periscopes. That's all. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like to uh, leap into these things without having some idea whether there's going to be this sort of thing. Um, who would be my for, pick for first guest? Um, I think I think it would either be well, it'll be one of three people. Um, it would probably either be Mike, Milo, or Stefan. I mean, you know, those are the guys that that um, really pulled me in to this sphere. You know, I've been off doing my own thing. Um, you know, just doing my own thing with the blog and that sort of thing. 
And so, um, you know, w once that we started doing guests, you know, I'd start there. Um, but, you know, as you know, then we, we, we have a lot of good and even great Castelia authors. And so, you know, we'd be getting people on like um, John C. Wright and Ivan Throne and, you know, Castelia's newest author, Tara McCarthy. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we definitely will do a regular book club thing, but it's not going to be just a, uh, it's not going to be just uh, a book club, you know, and so, um, so we'll have to, we'll have to see. Oh, Milo will be making a big splash soon. Don't worry. Um, his, his comeback, his comeback is uh, beginning. And, um, you know, you're not going to be able to get away from her. Uh, <laughs> it's very funny. Yeah, she's not at all interested. Um, and who is it? Um, you know, Mike was saying, you, you should have her, you know, show up like Shonda does. And she's kind of like, yeah, I don't think so. But um, she likes video even less than I do. So, um, <laughs> yeah, question one, it's very funny. Are you real? Um, the, uh, yeah, no, the dogs, of course. Um, you know, we have to be careful, though. Uh, the younger Ridgeback, um, he gets very depressed if, uh, if there's a, a picture um, up, if she puts a picture up on Twitter and he doesn't get very many likes, he gets very sad. So, um, and we have to be very careful about that. Uh, li limit his access to social media time. Um, anyhow, so, you know, we'll look into it. Um, we'll look into it, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, this is not something that's going to happen next week. It's probably not even going to happen next month, but, um, but we are going to uh, look into it seriously and figure out how this can best be done. You know, it's a little bit complicated, obviously, because, because I'm in, in Europe, and so, um, so we'll have to see. But anyhow, um, thanks for the input. I'm glad to hear that, um, that folks are, are interested. Will it be associated with Infogalactic? I don't know. Um, quite possibly. Quite possibly. Um, the <laughs> Owen Stanley would be awesome. We did a brainstorm, and, uh, and he was great. So, um, yeah, and so, <laughs> Nick Cole, Nick, Nick Cole, it'll be, it'll be impossible to get him off. <laughs> Nick, Nick just calls me up. I mean, I get these calls like, hey, Vox. Like, hi, Nick. What's up? Oh, nothing. Just wanted to say hi. <laughs> hi, Nick. <laughs> I think it's, we always end up talking for like an hour. So, anyhow, um, he, he like, Nick Cole like defines high energy. And so... Um, so yeah, that's, uh, uh, Dr. Pornell, it would be difficult. Um, I have actually interviewed Richard Spencer. We did a brainstorm with him. It was, it was good. Um, it was kind of funny because afterwards all the brainstormers, I were like, huh, he's supposed to be this like big, bad Nazi and he's kind of more moderate than like all of us. So, um, Anyhow, the, I, I, mean, I, I tend to feel, um, I tend to feel bad for Richard because, you know, I mean, he's just not that radical. He's just not that out there. And, um, you know, isn't, isn't Richard, no, Richard is not a Jew-hating white nationalist pig. That's, that's the irony of the way that he is portrayed, um, you know. I mean, I guarantee you that Richard Spencer is considerably more moderate on racial issues than probably 15% of the people that you work with. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, you know, just because they're not, just be, uh, no, I, no, I mean, I'm comparing it to, like, normal people around you. You know, you just... Um, 
you know, it's true. Don't, don't, do not believe what the media tells you about anyone. They, they lie. They lie so, so shamelessly. It's just not even, it's just not even funny. And so, um, you know, but that, I mean, that's his strategy is to just embrace it and, and, and hopefully demonstrate it to be false. And so, um, but, but see, that's the thing is it, the loaded terms, you know, I mean, here's, here's the fundamental problem with everybody that tries to do, oh, the, those loaded terms have, have lost their meaning. Well, guess what? It's rhetoric. What do I tell you about rhetoric in SJWs always lie? There is no information content in rhetoric. It is only there to provoke. It is only there to prove. We're not here to discuss Richard Spencer or Nikki, so either just drop it, okay? Um, you want to discuss Richard Spencer? Richard Spencer will be more than happy to talk to you. Just tell him you're from the media and you can talk to him for hours, okay? We're not here to discuss him. Um, but the point that I'm the point that I'm trying to make is that um, what is the point I'm trying to make? I'm kind of distracting myself there. Anyhow, a um, oh, rhetoric, right? There is no information content in rhetoric, okay? So, you know, those of you who are um, okay, this person's just an idiot. Bye bye. Um, it's kind of funny. These morons who like think, oh, I'm going to get out there and troll and disrupt this sort of thing. It's like, you know, you're blocked, you're gone, you'll never see it again. Is it worth it? Anyhow. Um, but the, the, so with rhetoric, there's no information content in rhetoric. And so the, um, you know, saying that, well, there, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It does it never means anything. It's only there for information for emotional manipulation and so as long as it effectively manipulates somebody as long as people respond to that emotional manipulation talking about its meaning is irrelevant again you, you know you're looking at it from a dialectical perspective you know you're trying to explain to the Chinese speakers, how things work in English, you know, it's not relevant. Uh, rhetoric does look, work better on certain groups. It does tend to work better on women. It does tend to work better on young people. It does tend to work better on gamma males. I mean, the more emotional someone is, the more um, susceptible to rhetoric they are. However, keep in mind that some of the people most susceptible to rhetoric are people who think they are highly logical and rational. You know, basically what that actually means is they've gotten very good at rationalizing their emotions. So, um, so you need to keep you need to keep in mind that. Um, yeah, I mean, Generation X doesn't uh, doesn't tend to be. Is it the same as being touched by a great speech? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's part of why the part of why you think the speech is great is because it rhetorically dinged, you know, your emotional buttons. They they, they managed to um, it managed to hit you, and everyone has. I mean, here's the thing: everybody, everybody is suspect, susceptible to rhetoric. Yes, the best speakers do mix rhetoric and dialectic. You know, the best rhetoric is based on the truth. And so if you, if you can, you know, if you uh, align effective rhetoric up with dialectical truth, that is when you tend to get some of the most stirring, most effective, most powerful and convincing rhetoric out there. So anyhow, it's, it's but, but, you know, just, you need to keep this stuff in mind. I mean, that's why I keep you know, talking about why it's so foolish to try to, uh, to devote all this effort to, to make a whole strategy around 
trying to defang the tactic of being called a Nazi or being called a racist. That's not a strategy. That's a counter tactic. And even if it works, it won't make any, it won't make much serious difference because it will simply switch to calling you something else that provokes the same emotional reaction that Nazi or racist or transphobic or whatever is. They will come up with something and it will work. And so you know, just instead of trying to like get them to switch from one piece of effective rhetoric to another, you know, why don't you just ignore all that and move on with your strategy? That's what you need to do. So, but, you know, if they were better strategists, they would not be a, um, you know, they would not be so ineffective in French. So, um, you know, the guys who are effective are the mean people. They, you know, in, instead of trying to defang the Nazi stuff, they use it to provoke emotional reactions. They use it as rhetoric themselves. They use it in a different way. So, um, so anyhow, it, it's, um, you know, the, the more we understand rhetoric and how it's effective, the easier it is to convince more and more people to come over to our side. And they will. Like I said, the alt-right is inevitable, not because we're smart, not because we're pretty, not because we can talk people into things, not because we have Pepe, you know. The reason that it's inevitable is because the broad socionomic trends, the social mood, the patterns and cycles of history are in the process, uh, are, are working in our favor. So. Um, how do you change people's minds by making them angry and offended? Um, very easily. That's how you, that's how you get them to change their minds. You got to remember, you've got to remember that people who are, are selected, the rabbits, are primarily motivated by fear. That is their prime, that is, so what they will do is if you put so much cognitive pressure on them, if you subject them to so much cognitive dissonance, and reality can, will do that on its own eventually, you know, they either have to crack and go crazy, or they break and they change their mind, and then they rationalize their change of mind. They'll never, they'll never tell you, oh, I changed, I changed my mind because I was, I was so scared of being left alone that I completely changed my point of view just so that I can fit in with the new majority. They will never say that. They will always come up with some rationalization of how, you know, this person went too far or, you know, or they suddenly have a strange new respect for this particular argument or something. You know, people lie to themselves about their own actions all the time. And so don't work, you know, <laughs> don't spurg out about that. Don't, don't say, but you used to say this, you know, em embrace the change, utilize the change. That's what you want them to do. That is the only way they're going to change their mind. They're not going to change your, their, your, you can make a rock solid logical case, walk somebody through it, explain it to them and prove every single step of the way with rock solid evidence and they will not change their mind. Put them under enough emotional pressure, they'll change their mind like that. So it's, uh, and it's hard, it's hard for the dialectically minded to accept that and to, and to ignore that, but you have to, because that's the only way they're going to change their mind. Aristotle told us this, what, 2,500 years ago. Some, there are, yeah, there are some people for whom no rational argument is sufficient. There are some people who cannot change their mind on the basis of information. 
It can only do so on the basis of emotion. So, use emotion. Use rhetoric. Use emotional pressure. Use pain. Use intellectual pain. So, anyhow, that's all I have. So, um, thanks for tuning in. I will keep you posted as, as things uh, develop. And thank you so much for your input. Have a good evening.